name is Mark Rowe, and I'm off camera, but I am also in Bearsville, New York. Very happy Correct. to be at the home of Warren Bernhardt. And thank you very much for letting us uh, bring our gear into your house. And my pleasure, my pleasure. I had a, well, two and a half hour drive to get here, and I had a spirited debate with myself about where to start with you, because you've done quite a bit, let's put it that way. And, uh, but I wanted to ask you about the most valuable player awards you've gotten from the Recording Association. Of from NARAS? Yeah, from NARAS. Yeah, that was uh, in, the, in the days when I was uh, pretty high up, first or second call on piano, on acoustic piano and electric piano in New York City, in the studios. Right. And I looked yeah. at uh, your discography, and yeah. there's like well over 200 listings on there. And it's fascinating to me that one month you could be playing a Muppet movie, and the next month playing with Jack D. Jeanette, or Something well, like that. that was deliberate on my part. And the people who were regular dyed-in-the-wool studio musicians, I was doing it because there weren't a lot of good-paying jazz gigs around. And I wanted to send my kids to school and stuff and pay the mortgage here on this place. And uh, I'd do dates, but I wasn't dedicated to it. And I'd have to take a hiatus and go off and play some real real, what I call real music, because most of the studio stuff wasn't what I really loved. It was pretty much to make a living, although every once in a while you run across something great doing a Michael Brecker album or something, you know. But, but uh, every couple of years I'd go off and do something, and people would say, you're crazy, Warren, you know, like, uh, you know how much money you've missed? And then every summer I'd go up to our place in northern Wisconsin for a month, the busiest month, of course, in the studio year is August. And I'd take my kids up to this cottage that we have on the lake. So I wasn't totally into the studio scene. You know, I wasn't dedicated to it. And if you take time off like that, are you uh, less likely to sort of get off the list? Uh, I didn't. Okay. I mean, everybody said, oh, that, oh the, they'll forget about you. The moment they call you, you're not there. But I never had that problem with anything. I don't know. I, I, I'm glad I did it the way I did it. Right. Let's and you, put it you that had way. enough, you had what you wanted. You know. Well, <laughs> you should see, go to some other guys' uh, discographies, and they're as long as from here to the ceiling. You know, oh. they, uh, they you played on a lot more albums than I did. I mean. But you might not know what was going to be put in front of you when you showed up for one of those kind of dates, right? Well, it depends on who the arranger was. If it were Klaus Elgerman or something, you'd know a month in advance, and you'd need to know a month in advance to look over the strange chords and the harmonies. If it were just a... a uh, Frankie Valley and the Four Seasons, you wouldn't have any idea what Charlie Colello is the arranger and what he'd bring in. You know, it was usually sight unseen. And I was a very good reader. Okay. Was it uh, chord charts sometimes and you just had to play what was appropriate to the, the tune? Yeah, sometimes. I remember doing a film score once that... Uh, well, I, I won't name the writer because it might be embarrassing, but... It was with a full orchestra, and I come up to the piano, and it says A minor concerto. And he comes up, and he says, well, I, I was up so late writing the orchestra parts, I didn't get a chance to write the piano part. So can you come up with something, listen to the orchestra a couple of times, and then play like what you, you play on a concerto? I said, I said, OK, but I want a little more money for that, you know, if I got to do the writing. So we worked that out on the spot. You run into things like that. Or you run into things like um, Neil Morricone. I did a bunch of films with him. He's won a lot of Oscars and stuff. He's the maestro. Mm -hmm. And every note was perfectly written out and with as though it were Ravel or something. You know, so it runs the whole gamut. Did you ever have the, uh, you were over, overdubbing a part 
I'm going to talk back to the producer and do a take. And that was perfect, Warren. Now do it again. Ever? Did that ever happen to you? It always happens. <laughs> that was just great, guys. Let's do another one. Yeah. And then, and then the other one was never as great as, as the great one. Because you'd already said the best you could do. Uh -huh. you know? And it's usually a group consciousness thing, a group effort in that case. I mean, unless somebody obviously screwed things up, which I often did too. I mean, you know, there's flaws. And Anthony Jackson was famous because he'd say, flaw, and stop a take and yell out, flaw. You know, whereas he could have just overdubbed it later, but it was 93 guys in the studio, you know, the producers going, oh. No. But Anthony wanted it perfect. You know. wow. And was he talking Changes about... strings every take. Oh. But he wasn't just talking about himself, he could have been talking about... No, he's talking about himself. Oh, he was, okay. Uh, he, when he heard something that he didn't want to hear, he let everybody know that, that wasn't what I can do. Yeah. And, and I, lo I always loved that, because it was, well, he played on some of my albums, and uh, he did it, but it, it wasn't a big problem, mm -hmm. because it was a flaw. You know. so but I thought it was an unusual way to treat it. Uh -huh. I usually kept quiet, and then went up to the arranger or the producer and said, look, maybe I can do something better, do you want to overdub it? Mm -hmm. How long was a typical session? Were they four hours? Recording dates are three yeah. hours, okay. usually with a possible overtime. Mm -hmm. But sometimes they went long, 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 mm -hmm. which was good because I could pay the tuition. Yeah. Do you ever hear yourself on the radio on some of those uh, pop type tunes? Or do you not listen to those kind of songs? Uh, memorable ones, yeah. I can hear myself. Uh, like American Pie or something, I, I can hear that. And uh, Paul Griffin and I both played on it, so it's, I know which is which. Were you playing the acoustic? On, yeah. On that tune? On some parts of some it. Some parts yeah. of it. Okay. Yeah. And uh, I mean, something like that, that's, that's a big hit, yeah, you'd recognize it. But yeah. I wasn't on a lot of, uh, that wasn't my thing, you know, to get established as yeah. a hit. It's, it's actually, Something I've pretty much forgotten all about. Mm -hmm. you know. yeah. Well, you had uh, a classical upbringing. Very. And then you were exposed to blues and jazz in Chicago, is that right? Well, yeah, but eventually. But the classical thing went, went very deep. I mean, I played my first concert when I was six. And Mendelssohn and Beethoven and... Dakin and Bach and stuff. And, uh, and I concertized quite frequently until my father was a pianist and he knew all the great pianists. He knew a lot of the great opera singers and everything, conductors. So my, I, I, I don't really want to go into detail because it seems like terrible name dropping, but uh, he knew all the greats and, and I play for them all. And there were certain aspects that uh, I had weaknesses and strengths, which I, I think I was destined to become a pianist because I tried everything else. I went to school and studied science and everything. I got completely away from music after my father passed away when I was 13. Mm -hmm. I, I, I couldn't listen to music without getting very torn up inside. Oh. Uh, but uh, nobody ever had to teach me about pedaling, for instance. I, I came to this planet knowing how to phrase and how to pedal a piano. I wouldn't sleep unless they put my cradle underneath the piano. My dad or Joseph Levine or one of his friends would play Chopin, and then I'd go to sleep. My earliest memories of the underneath of a Steinway with all the wood going around, the big brass thing. So it was destined. And uh, I studied privately with some really great pianists, among them the Levines, uh, Madame Levine and Joseph Levine. Uncle Dova, I couldn't say Joseph, I said Dova. But he was uh, around a lot, he was a good friend of my dad's. 
he was one of the greatest Chopin players of all time. Do you recall if your father had an opinion about the jazz world? And the pop? Well, he'd had a vaudeville band in the 20s, and he was a church organist too, and there was a, he lived in a medium-sized town in northern Wisconsin, Wausau, where I was born. And since, since it's grown a lot, it's kind of like Newburgh, New York, it's grown in the last few years. But uh, you could have, for X amount of dollars, you could have Larry Bernhardt's band without Larry Bernhardt, or if twice as much money, Larry Bernhardt was there. So he figured that thing out, and then he taught, and he started conservatories. And, he went to New England Conservatory, and uh, he was a great guy. And uh, my childhood was simply amazing. I, I'll just say it was amazing. Great, greatest conductors, pianists, opera singers were all over at the house, and I was playing for them, and they were singing for me. And, uh, so it was natural to become a musician. However, I stopped playing. And didn't and in high school I did a couple things with the high school orchestra played Mozart concertos and Rachmaninoff's first concerto and stuff. Uh, generally did drama and sports and stuff. Stay away from the music. And then I went to the University of Chicago and studied science and chemistry, and eventually nuclear physics. But the wild thing about here's the destiny part. The University of Chicago is smack in the middle of African American ghetto at that time, where there must have been between 50 and 100 jazz clubs, all local musicians, all willing to share every all their knowledge with this young white guy that didn't know anything. I, I was very impressed with how uh, how well that went. There was no racial thing at all. There. It was great. So I, uh, in college, I began going. McKee's Disc Jockey Lounge was right around the corner, and Eddie Lockjaw Davis and Johnny Griffin were there. And then I'd go to the Sutherland, and Miles was there, and I'd go up and hear Oscar Peterson and you know Errol Garner and all these guys. It didn't take long. I mean, a couple nights of hearing Oscar sitting up close to him, and uh, going to hear that great sextet with Train and. Uh, Cannonball, and those guys, that, that changed my life. I tell Jimmy Collins when I see him, I said, you, you got no idea how you changed my life. And one night, I dropped out of school, started playing in clubs around Chicago. Didn't know anything, and all the musicians would help me. Iris Sullivan helped me a lot. Herbie Hancock was around, and he was just starting too. Jackie Jeanette was a piano player. Uh, uh, we were, play at the Student Union at Chicago every Thursday, and I just began picking that up more and more and more. Uh, rebuilt an old piano in the fraternity house I was staying in, and uh, I started playing more and more nights, and eventually it took over. Even though I, I was living at home with my mom, by then I, I, didn't, I wasn't making enough playing in these little clubs, but I definitely knew that's, that it got me. That music got me. It would be made up on the spot by these most ingenious people. True genius. I mean, if you sit next to Oscar, this far from his right hand from me, you say, wow, that's genius. You know, or Wynton Kelly. Or was the so fact that, these that was the Chicago influence was, right. was in there. When did you, is that about the time you would learn about chord structure and chord melody and playing without music? Yeah, what's a four chord, you know? Uh, why does the blues go to the four chord and the, you know, before it goes to the five chord and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. Very basic stuff. Bill Matthew, I don't know if you remember his name. He was arranging for Duke Ellington at the time and he taught me oh, a bunch of Jerry Mulligan tunes and like Walking shoes and things like that, line for lions, and uh, he eventually ended up living in San Francisco and directing the Sufi Choir, a very famous choir. And he helped me a great deal. Iris Sullivan was an amazing talent in Chicago. 
that they were willing to take this kid that didn't know anything and say, you know, okay, listen to the drummer, not to your foot. Okay, that's the first thing I want you to do. One of these guys. Huh? Okay, let's let the drummer do that. Okay, just take that out of the equation. Stuff like that, real basic, good stuff. And, well, it would be better if you might harmonize it a little differently. My real harmonic teacher came later, and that was Bill Evans, and, uh, when we were living together and stuff. So, so your jazz education was in the clubs with working musicians. Just doing it. Just doing yeah. it. Yeah, it was, uh, I never took a lesson or anything. I mean, after the age of eight I don't know, or nine, I never, uh, I, I never took a, a lesson with anybody. But later on, Bill Evans would sit across on the couch and he'd say, well, try uh, working downwards. Play the melody and, and the left hand, but play descending diatonic thirds in the right hand and on each change as you get to it. Just see what that sounds like in eighth notes or ascending or something. He'd, he'd speak in musical terms. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't so much as being a teacher, more of a mentor, friend. And then we'd just sit down, and this is after I moved to New York in 62, right? He came and stayed at my place for, uh, it seemed like years, because we'd play from about 9 in the morning till 11 at night, you know, four hands. I'd play the top, and then he'd play the bottom, and vice versa. And then we'd read all the Beethoven symphonies and all the Haydn symphonies, everything, every four hands literature that we could find. He was a great reader. So, uh, he taught me how to be a great reader. That helped later on. I think I was kind of a slow reader. Bill was very quick. How did your mother feel about your... You must have decided at that point, I'm going, I'm going to be a musician. Oh, the family... Uh, well, my, my mother I was especially close to. When I dropped out of school, she was devastated. Mm -hmm. I was playing in the College of Complexes, but... Kerouac was reading poetry every night, and Ferlinghetti, and Allen Ginsberg, all these guys, and I'm playing this piano with the legs burnt off of it, and I'm right in the middle of this scene that she knows nothing about, that was the beatnik scene then, you know, at the height of it. And uh, I've been blessed, let me tell you, truly, all my life, with music and being surrounded by creativity and stuff. Um, the, uh, thing that changed everything in 62, uh, I was with Paul Winter, had a sextet at that time, which was really a hard-driving modern jazz group. It had nothing to do with the New Age concept that he's into now. And we won the Intercollegiate Jazz Festival, I remember, in Washington, D.C. We did all these competitions. Right? And so we got Booked, we got signed by John Hammond, signed us, and he brought us to New York. And you know, I was one of the guys he brought to New York from Columbia Records, famous guy. And uh, at the same time, Kennedy was elected, and uh, he was already in office by the time that uh, I don't know how it happened, but Kennedy asked us to do a, a tour, a six-month tour of South and Central America and all the islands with Paul's sextet. And uh, so my mother thought that was great. Oh, you're going to go see the world. This is my first time out of the nest. I, you know, I'm an only child and pampered as a kid, you know, a concert artist. And so that was eye-opener for me, just to begin with. And then coming back, uh, I lost the train of thought here, what I'm trying to explain to you. Uh, age. Uh, well, he's we got awarded as, uh, by Kennedy. This is by my mother. Yeah. And uh, he called us up and said, would you come and play in the White House, do the first jazz concert ever at the White House as a reward? And we'll pay your way. You know, you don't get paid for it, but we'll record it. And, and it's coming out on the record soon. 50 years exactly this year. And when my mother got the invitation to come to the White House from Jackie Kennedy to hear me play, 
everything was fine after that. That was. Oh, you're playing jazz. That's great. <laughs> this is within two years of the time I'd begun to play jazz. I'm playing at the White House. So. Quite an arc to your career already. Uh, already, <laughs> yeah. And I hadn't moved to New York yet and become a professional, which is yet to come. The end of that year. So. And that's a whole other story. Okay. There. There's a lot of stories, and I, I, I actually I am hesitant to tell you all this because. I wrote the down the story of my life in a book and with a 200 other people. We wrote, we wrote down the story of their lives and we threw them in a big pot and burned them. Uh, just to teach us about what a story it was, you know. So I'm hesitant to, to go into these details because I like to be in, in the moment and focus on okay. now. But. Well, we're going to focus on now. But, okay. you know, I don't mind hearing the stories either. Yeah. I mean, there were some good ones. Yeah. yeah. I mean, did you find uh, in the early 60s, I think, in New York City, did you have to do non-musical jobs to help pay the rent? Well, Columbia brought us here. My first gig was at the Village Vanguard for a week. But uh, actually, that was after we'd been here a couple of weeks. My first day in New York in 62, and it was in September, I think, uh, Gene Lee's was the editor at Downbeat, and he was a good friend, and he was a songwriter and a singer, and, I, and I'd accompanied him in Chicago and the Midwest. So, uh, he called up and he said, hey, I'm having breakfast with Bill Evans. Do you want to come? It was my first day in New York. So we go to the Olympia Diner on 107th and Broadway, and uh, there's Gene and Bill sitting there. You know, and, and by that time, Bill was my total hero, because I, I'd heard he had to think three albums on it, Portrait and Jazz, had just come out. I was totally in love with his playing. He replaced Winton and Oscar and Errol and all these other guys. Can I ask why? Uh, it's a hard thing. He just really got to my heart immediately when I heard him. When I first heard him, I started weeping. I don't know why that heavy. So I get a chance to meet him and he said, hey, I'm playing out of the Vanguard tonight. Uh, why don't you come down and check out the trio? It was, it was by that, Scott had already passed away, so it was Chuck Israel from Paul Monson. And I said, great. And Max knew me at the Vanguard, so I went down and the place is full. And I said, oh, Max, uh, where am I going to go? Bill asked me to come down. He said, oh, don't worry about it. And he takes me, and there's one empty seat right next to the, here's the end of the keyboard right here, and here's the seat. So I could have reached over and touched Bill. And there was like a spotlight coming down out of this seat. It was like a storybook kind of thing. I'm talking about being blessed, you know. And, oh, he said, he saved you a seat. And, uh, so then I became, uh, you know, I, I think every night Miles played in New York or Bill did, I was there. Like I didn't have any work after, you know, the big star comes to New York, works for a week, does a record, and that was it. So I was playing gigs out in Far Rockaway with bird acts and you name it, you know, uh, little mafia joints and everything. And, and I was earning a living. Sure. But, but I wasn't an innovator or anything, no, no big, great shakes, and I was a good player. I had to pay my dues at that point, and, uh, but I, I tried to, I had the technique down of going in uh, nursing a beer at the five spot from eight o'clock till two in the morning, one, one beer, you know, the, all the bartenders and the, the half note, all the, all the clubs. So I, I was really into, it was, everything was music you know, for several years there, occasional gig with Paul Winter, which was nice. And then Bill came to live with me, which was really nice. That was, that was a, uh, I don't know what I w would have done had I not had that experience. You know. Was he struggling financially too? I mean, the fact that he had three or four albums out maybe didn't necessarily translate to. Well, by the, by the 60s, he was doing okay. He still didn't have Helen Keene as a manager. He didn't have a manager yet, but he was doing okay. You know, uh, I mean, he'd won all the awards already, 
the downbeat critics poll and the popular poll, and everything, which in those days was a big deal. You know, it ensured that you were you could get work everywhere. Work didn't pay much. I remember Vanguard paid eighty-six dollars a week for a side man and twice that much for the leader. You know, in those days, but that you could live on that. My rent was a hundred dollars a month for a whole floor of a brownstone. Uh, I mean, we managed to do it, you know, with, with my piano here. That was for, the, for that this, whole this time. This piano behind you has followed you around. It was my grandfather's. Wow. Uh, it's the reason I'm here. Uh, that's another story that goes way back. My mother talked her father into buying a piano so that Larry Bernhardt would come over and play the piano for them. My grandfather was a music lover. His name was Warren, too. And uh, so she, that was her thing. And then she said, can I take music lessons with Larry? And I think they worked on one Chopin prelude. That was it. And then they were married soon thereafter. So this piano is present. And I inherited it later. But uh, uh, Yeah, piano is a inextricably involved. That was a whole other thing, too, that gets into the whole synthesizer trip, which I tried. And yeah. Now I'm pretty much back to the okay. piano. Were you, um, did you remain close with Bill until his death? Yes. Very close, but in a, a strange kind of way. Uh, pool playing close, bowling close, uh, golf driving range close. Uh, riding around, going to movies together. Uh, you know, he'd coming over for dinner. Like, uh, I remember my 40th birthday was in this house and he brings out the cake and stuff. So that was fun. Uh, so we, we were friends. And he wasn't that, he was 10 years older than I was. And he was, uh, he considered himself to be a regular guy from New Jersey. He said, I know and, and all this stuff and blah, blah, blah and everything, but what I am is what I am. You want to go shoot some pool, you know. And so we go shoot pool and get Monk to come along and stuff, you know. He was a nice guy to know. I mean, he, he knew everybody. Billy the Kid was very calm, like Monk. Hey, Billy the Kid. What's happening? Uh, I wish we had a camera for some of that. Oh, it was a funny story, yeah. Bill uh, uh, had a great sense of humor. And I have a whole shelf of books that he gave me, all, like all the Woody Allen books and Stephen Leacock and Thurber. Well, I knew Thurber when I was a kid, and that's a whole other story. But uh, I used to hang out up at the New Yorker because my dad's best friend was an editor up there. And so I knew E.B. White and all these guys, Truman Capote. I go to the Algonquin for the, at the round table. I was the only kid that ever went there. Had lunch with all the, Alexander Wolcott and all these guys. It was a pretty cool childhood. Plus, my dad had free tickets to Carnegie Hall every night. So, I three or four nights a week, I'd, I'd either fall asleep in Carnegie Hall or in the Russian tea room afterwards with the artists. You know, I had this the most amazing childhood. Uh, it, it all added up. I mean, the reality set in, well, you're going to have to make a living, you know. Uh, there's, there's starting, people know you can read really well, you can play in the studios, you can go out and play with bands, you know. Mm -hmm. and, then, and then I started making my own records, you know, in the 70s. So that was a whole other thing. It was just total love for the music. It wasn't, wasn't a money-making proposition mm -hmm. as much as it was just love. That's sort of ironic, you know, if you can make more money playing uh, with the rock and roll acts or whatever. But it, it, as the 60s went on, did you go out and play current music? I don't know, like Love and Spoonful or that kind of Well, I of recorded thing. with them in uh -huh. 64. But uh, what changed my life entirely was... Uh, I was playing with Jeremy Steig a lot because he was out with Paul Winter and, and I, he was a great flute player. 
And Bill loved had graduated from college as a flute major, so he knew Jeremy, and then the three of us would play all the time. Bill would get out of playing the last set of the Vanguard, Jeremy and I would go sit in with Eddie Gomez and Marty Morell and play the last set of the Vanguard a lot. And uh, Jeremy got a call from Tim Harden, who knew him, and Tim said, I'm coming to New York to play a gig. Uh, can you get a band together? And Jeremy said, sure. And he got me on keyboards. And here, were, Tim Harden's thing was not, it was jazzy folk and great poetry and the most amazing singer I've ever heard in my life, all poured into one and a complete nutcase on the other, on the other side. But I spent, uh, I had to unlearn everything I'd learned to that point about music to play with Tim. I had to learn how to, how can you play on just an A chord for 20 minutes and to make that sound great and make people weep with it and stuff. And that was really, I was into changes, you know, like what are these things called changes? Da, 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 giant steps, all that. And for me to have to totally unlearn that to play with Tim and, and I formed this great bond with Tim. It's funny, the, Bill was a junkie and so was Tim, and, and, and I wasn't, so I kept getting involved with these uh, people that had terrible drug problems, but I, I escaped all that. That's another blessing. So uh, I worked off and on with Tim. Uh, we became very close. I moved up here as a result and came up here to do an album and never left with Tim, and he knew Jimi Hendrix and you know, all the guys that lived up here, Janis Joplin and everything. And so we'd go out and do gigs with Tim in San Francisco or something at the Fillmore, and we'd, we'd uh, it would be Richie Havens and then Cream and then Tim and then Big Brother and the Holden Company or something with Janis, things like that. Or a lot, lot played with opposite or knew all the people on that scene. You know. The Fillmore and uh, Fillmore East later, and Winterland and the Avalon, all the great San Francisco. I was right in the middle of the Haight Ashbury thing too in the 60s. So that was, that had changed everything. I, Bill and I lost touch. You know, he was out very busy, and so was I. I was doing folk, and then I started playing rock and roll with some of these people, and I, I loved that. It turned out. That was a whole other facet. And then I'd play folk music with some other acts, and I'd play country with some. And uh, the, it's, my, my thing is not just jazz at all. It's so many different facets. I'd say there's probably nine different facets to my music that, that I focus on equally. You know. And the classical one is, still, one is still alive, too. Well, that's what I was wondering, if starting with classical music somehow opened your ears so that when these other things came along, you didn't shut down to them. I don't know. That's another blessing, I guess, in uh, how I kept an open mind. I mean, purists never appealed to me. Mm -hmm. I mean, even, even re very great purists, you know. I, I remember having arguments with Bill about it. He said, you know, you should be playing jazz all over the world. I said, but, but I'm out, I'm playing rock and roll all over the world. I'm going out with Simon Carpunkel, you know. I'm going to play for 600,000 people in Rome. And so, uh, he said, oh, how can I do that, you know? Like, <laughs> I said, well, you got to stop being a purist is the first thing, you know, and, and just take what comes along and see if you want to do it. And I was, a, I studied Tai Chi for, Quite a few years there. There's, there's a lot of this energy moving around. Uh, well, how did you answer someone if they said, "Well, you can never be a real jazz player if you're going to be associating with Art Garfunkel or you know sharing"? I don't know. I just played two weeks ago at the Iridium, and I was I was playing my ass off, and mm -hmm. um, whatever that's worth. That's what my other musicians told me in the band. Uh, I got, I, I don't know, I always, I, one of my first rules, I, I have very few rules, and, and one of them was not to be a purist, to be open to other things. 
like if music's good, music's good, and if music sucks, music sucks. It doesn't matter if it's jazz or classical or whatever it is. And I trust, I have faith in my own ear and my heart especially to, to learn that difference and uh, only pay attention to the things that are good you know, whenever possible. Once in a while I'd paint myself into a corner and playing a McDonald's hamburger commercial and I said, this is not good, you know, but you pay a lot of money, maybe that's good. So there was a tuition know. thing to keep in mind. Well, yeah, I was a father by then and uh, had three kids and you know, they had to think about things like that. And I wasn't a great innovator, maybe that is another reason, but my other rule was always be the worst guy in whatever band you're in. I still use that rule. So, consequently, I've very rarely ever been a, a band leader because I make a great sideman. I, I like to be around guys that teach me something, you know. And uh, always be at a level below where they're at, which was the case with, with the, my present band, Limage, where I feel like uh, I'm the weakest player in the band. Mm. Uh, I'm not sure I'd agree with that, but. You know, I, I understand what you're saying is if you have people that you're trying to play up to, it certainly is uh, beneficial. Well, I mean, it's hard to uh, play with, with some of these guys. It's hard to have, uh, to know Jimi Hendrix and, and say that I'm better than you are. You know, it's really hard. Or Jim Morrison or Tim, or any of those guys, I mean, that world. Or Paul Simon. Amazing, amazing musician, amazing poet, amazing songwriter, amazing performer. Yeah. Well, to me, it's if I could make a million dollars a night, I, if that, my mother used to say to me, "If you're so damn smart, how come you ain't rich?" Yeah. Uh, I, I got something to learn from all these people. It sounds like to me you have a really healthy. Like you know what you like and you feel good about your playing, but you're also able to fit in with all these other musicians and artists. Yeah, well, I, it's not that I didn't work on that because I, I had a terrible problem with ego and conceitedness, being an only child growing up in this atmosphere in New York where I was a prodigy and playing concerts, you know. Rudolf Serkin wanted me to come live with him and study and uh, have tutors and a governess and stuff like that. And my father saying, do you want to do that? I said, no. Stuff. I mean, uh, I want to keep my friends. I want to play sports. I want to go to school. I mean, a lot of different probabilities could have happened and maybe have happened. We don't, we're not sure. Uh, millions of them. Billions. Uh, every time you turn a corner, you're not quite sure where it's heading, you know. Uh, especially, in, in that, and I kept that attitude open in, in music, too. You still uh, feel that way? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, what, I, I'll tell you what I'm doing musically right now is I'm trying to learn this very difficult set of variations by Rachmaninoff to play in concerts, you know, and some sh seven or eight Chopin etudes and some nocturnes, and plus the Rhapsody on the theme of Paganini, which is like setting the bar extremely high. Mm -hmm. Something I've tried to do many times in my life. I said, I'm 73, this is my last chance. I mean, if I, if I can get over that bar, you know, it would be a great thing. So throwing yourself challenges is, uh, it keeps you really vibrant. Working it has nothing to do with jazz, you know, uh, and yet in a way it's intimately connected with it. If you can, I mean, the way to play classical music well is is the way that Wynton Kelly would play a solo. I mean, you never heard it before, you'll never hear it again. Uh, it's got a swing, it's got to have tone, it's got to have pulse and shape, and, and if you play it that way. I mean, following all the indications that the 
composer, and especially, well, we're lucky in the case of someone like Rachmanov, because we can listen to him play that same piece. Chopin, we can. We can listen to Courtauld, who studied with Chopin, to see how it was done then. But uh, if you can make it fresh without destroying the intent, you know, and then, then it's the same thing, no matter what it is, what kind of music you play. Does it help from playing jazz that you're, I, I'm assuming, that when you play classical music, you're more likely to be able to see the harmonic movement and the chords in the piece than some classical players never really learned that part of it. You're absolutely on the money there, yeah. That's exactly true. There's many classical players that I can't stand to listen to because they don't know that. They haven't discovered what it's like to improvise. It doesn't have to be jazz as much as it has to be really solid, good improvisation. I mean, most of your great composers in the Eurocentric thing, oh, we haven't even gotten to African music. Uh, that influence, I mean, that's a whole other thing. But uh, the Euro, European, Eurocentric composing community, uh, they were all great improvisers. You know. The greatest of them all, Beethoven, was a, was a superb improviser. And that's my opinion. You know, I think he's the granddaddy. Some people say Bach, but I say Beethoven. And I've played enough of him that, that I think I know, and I've listened to enough. You know. at, least, at least for me, I'm satisfied. Uh, when I approach a piece of his, like, like this is going to be really a challenge, even the simplest piece. Mm -hmm. This is going to be really something. This was written by a guy who was stone deaf. Mm -hmm. but let's start right there. I, mean, I just did the Opus 111, the last... 30 seconds or not. It was a famous part that's jazz. It's written in what, 29, 30 seconds or something. And if you play it that way, it really makes sense. You see what he intended. I mean, he was what, 200 years before Philly Joe Jones, and he was doing the same shit. I mean, he's, he's something else. And all these guys, I mean, you don't get famous. There's, just, there's no bogus stuff going on there. I mean, you don't become an immortal without being immortal. You know. If you were in the middle of a classical piece and you stumbled, could you improvise your yeah. way out of it, uh, back into it? Yeah, yeah, it feels pretty bad. Uh -huh. It's awkward. Mm -hmm. I did it, I, that same concert I did, the, I recorded the concerts uh, a couple of years ago that, uh, in, here in Woodstock. And, uh, I stumbled in the WC's fireworks, it's the Faux d'Artifice, and, uh, and I improvised about a four bar section there that WC never thought of. But I managed to get it and come back. And listening back to the tape, it's like, oh, no, oh, you know, what? You know OK, you, you, you got it back. Yeah. I mean, I came from an age, a different age that all of the conservatories are turning out these technically perfect, stamping them out. It's almost like the Monty Python meeting of life in the beginning of that, where they stamp out another human being. That's the way they're stamping out jazz artists and all kinds of supposedly creative people. But uh, are they missing the boat? And uh, is, there, is there something more to it than, than that, just being technically perfect? And I, I, I grew up knowing Arthur Rubenstein, for instance, and he'd make a lot of mistakes. And occasionally a, a real messy thing, but he was glorious. I mean, to listen to, to lie under the piano and listen to him play Chopin, I mean, it was fucking unbelievable. 
you were under in my the piano. pajamas, you know. And, and, and you were under the piano when Rubens. Yeah. Was, yeah. yeah. A lot of guys. A lot of guys. But I mean, it was that era where mistakes were okay. There were there was about 150 years in there where critics didn't mind that as long as the heart and the uh, the, the correct feeling and the, and the awesomeness of it all came through. What's a mistake, you know, or, or you forgot? You know. I remember I got a good lesson. I was learning a, a Toccata by Paradis in A major. It's, it's, uh, it's a simple piece, but it, it's not simple. It's, it's uh, a lot of answering uh, response and answering in the different hands. And uh, Toccata means touch, you know, a lot of heavy touching. And, and uh, Dame Mayra Hess was over at our house for dinner, and I played the Toccata for her, and I was just learning it, you know, I was stumbling through it. So that was on like a Friday night or something. Sunday afternoon, we went to hear her at town hall, and I was like in the fifth row or something, and she looks down at me after the concert, she said, I'd like to play an encore for a, a really good young friend of mine, and points to me and looks at me. And she sits down and plays the Toccata, and she spaces out and forgets where she is. I mean, she, she really lost it. She couldn't get it back. She, 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 she apologized to everybody. But uh, sometimes you lose it, and you really lose it. I mean, you can't find it. You can't get back to it. And that's where I'm sure the, uh, it, it hasn't happened to me in an awful thing like that, but uh, if it ever does, I'm sure I'll be very thankful I learned what I know. I'm, I'm going to Green Dolphin Street or something. <laughs> like, uh, uh, Why what the hell? <laughs> you know, well, there's worse things. You're going to die, you know? Yeah. Uh, there are worse things. Yeah, I mean, you know, it feels like awful if you forget. You know, I was going to talk... Uh, later but but i have these interesting thoughts about jazz education these days as it goes on and it seems to me the hardest thing to teach is what you're talking about is to play with heart and and soul and i'm i feel really left behind when i read some of the articles about how to play x well, I did a bunch of tapes. Did you ever see any of my educational stuff? I tried to somehow skate around that. Uh, sometimes I regret that I, I've done it because I get letters from people, I thought you were going to teach me to play like Red Garland. You know? And I, I'll, I'll, I'll write them back. I said, no, I'm going to teach you to play like you. You know, that's what I'm hoping for. And that was my thing. Am I making too much noise? I don't know. Uh, that's the intent. Um, uh, I don't read those articles. I deliberately stayed away. I went to one IAJE convention, and that was enough for me. One, one of those. Things. Some great players played there. That was nice. But I, I didn't dig the whole vibe. I, uh, I stayed away from it. I haven't done any more. I did one with Donald Fagan about songwriting, but. Uh, done any of my own. I think I, I said what I had to say about that. And they're still very popular and they help a lot of people. I, I get thousands of letters and stuff about it. Well, part of that, I think, is the kind of it, gigs that you used to play to make money, now people are doing it in jazz education to make a living. Well, that's okay. You know, you got to make a living. Yeah. Uh, I don't, I don't think there's any boundaries in the universe. You know, just, there aren't. If you really study. Uh, Self-discovery is what Bill used to call it. Self-realization. That's what jazz is. I mean, there's all this universal mind out there, and you just pick your parts and distill it down and what comes out is you and uh, and you discover about what you are as a result of doing that, that process. What just kicked in? Hmm? What just kicked in? Oh, the heater? A 
furnace, I'll be glad to say, because it's 20 degrees out and going down fast. Why is it annoying? <laughs> Let's take a break and get a glass of water anyway, okay? We'll, we'll wait for the furnace to go. Okay, you had mentioned self, something about self-discovery. Oh, the, well, yeah, the really learning about jazz is self-discovery, but what Bill Evans used to tell me was he wouldn't show me anything, you know, any of his voicings or anything. I, I was uh, allowed to look over his shoulder if I wanted to, but things are happening so fast. I could never really, you know, you can't pick anybody's brain that way. Mm -hmm. uh, some, up, some people can do that and then they can write it down and you can read the transcriptions and then see, oh, that's what he was doing. Wow, I wouldn't do that. But. Mm -hmm. He said, I won't show you because I don't want to rob you of the joy that you're going to experience when you discover it yourself. That's why I don't teach. So that's why, you know. And it uh, made a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. You know, especially, especially in, in jazz. I, mean, I think, I, I have no idea. I've never, I've always wanted to go to Senegal and, and sit in with those guys, with Yusuf and Dura's guys or something, learn. That Jack DiGiannetti went over there and said it was just amazing, the drumming going on. But I, that's my latest craze that, that hit America, that hit me at the same time, and, and it, I see it coming out of my writing now, you know, more and more influences of, from, from that continent. There is something about that music, even even the way sometimes I've heard something. It sounds like they even tune their guitars a little bit differently to give that. Song. Oh, it's it's yeah, it's magical. Yeah, it's some great stuff. Yeah, the guitar playing is something else. Yeah. The best show I ever saw in my life was here at the Bearsville Theater with Yusu and Dua. I don't know if you know anybody that. Ever heard that band? And then I, the second best show was Yusu Endure in Kingston at UPAC a couple of years ago. He had a guitar, guitar players on, at Bearsville on each side of the stage, like in stereo, each playing something totally different and totally right. It was just nothing out of place. Great dancing, great talking drum. It was amazing. And the next time I saw him, he had on like a shirt and slacks and he didn't dance. And it was still some of the greatest music I've ever heard. So there, there's something going on. And uh, playing, I, I got to play with Vincent Nguini and uh, Rakiti Kamalo with Paul Simon, you know, the Graceland guys and stuff. And Tony Cedros. And they got something to say. It's just, uh, they're really great musicians. Yeah. Let, me, let me zoom through. Uh, <laughs> it's a little hard to pick things, but. When, when you got um, the Steps Ahead group going. Mike Maneri. Yeah. Was the first that, year was Steps. Yeah. Oh, and Don Rolnick was the original pianist. Okay. Steve Gann. Yeah. Uh, Eddie Gomez, Michael Brecker. And then Eliani Elias joined and Peter Erskine joined because Steve was busy with something else. And then when Eliani left, I, I was asked to join the band. That was another co-op band. Mm -hmm. These, um, this is my second co-op band, which takes a unanimous decision to take the tiniest step. It's really painful. You know, nobody can say uh, what we're doing next. You know, well, that, that was more Mike's baby. You know, like, like he could he could kind of guide the way. Yeah. That, that's a long association in my life, my career too, mm -hmm. going back playing with him for. 46 years now or something. Yeah. Well, He's an amazing make, player. You make He's me leapfrog to Lamage. And, and well? I, and I wondered, uh, there's, a, there's a little clip of you guys on YouTube, of course. In, in the, the old dress, days? In the dressing room, no. The, oh, on Japan or something? No, I, well, it might be in Japan. But I was curious, like... Tony if, did that, Okay, yeah. if there's arguments, who wins? And who settles them? Uh, I guess the band splits up or something. I, I don't know. We we split up in the 70s. We were a, kind of a, a, a barn band. You've heard of garage bands? Yeah. Well, Mike had a barn, and okay. we were a barn band. And then Spinoza joined us on guitar. 
was Tony Levin on bass and Steve Gannett drums and Mike Maneri on vibes and I played Rhodes and clavinet and then the original band where we didn't have a piano and Moog, mini Moog. And uh, that was in my synthesizer days. I still love the Fender Rhodes. I think it's a fabulous instrument. And I've been playing fake ones now, the uh, Nord that has all the keyboard sounds on it. I love it. Oh, it's, you know, it's not heavy. You can have a promoter supply one and plug in your computer and get all your own sounds. And it's great. But it's not the real thing, like a real Fender Rhodes is. You'd have to be a billionaire to carry one of those around. Mm -hmm. You'd have Especially to be, you know, in that upper echelon. Of, you'd have to be playing eight. arenas to, to carry yeah. a road thing. Yeah. Or big concert halls. Yeah. But clubs, forget it. Uh, small concerts. Well, I but, think you've been involved in some of the really better fusion things, at least in my opinion. Well, I was uh, the original fusion band. I think I was in the original fusion band of all time. It might have been with Jeremy Stein and Randy Brecker and myself and uh, Joe Beck. I'm trying to remember who, who else was in it. But we were doing that stuff before anybody else, before the Brecker Brothers. Uh, and then after Tim Harden, one of his flake out experiences, we formed Jeremy and the Satyrs, which was Eddie Gomez. And, Adrian Gillery singing and playing blues and harp and uh, Donald McDonald on drums and myself. And that was a, a real fusion band because we, we played rock and roll and blues and jazz and everything that we loved. Whatever we loved, we played. I remember uh, a memorable gig was at the Village Gate. At the top of the gate, I don't know if you, they had the bottom room, which was the big room, and the top of the gate was kind of well, a lot of good guys played there. Bill Evans played there at the top of the game. Larry Coriel, a lot of guys. And uh, we went in there with Jeremy and the Satyrs, and we, we got halfway through the first tune, and uh, the manager came up and says, cut it, guys, cut it, cut it. Uh, <laughs> I said, really? I said, I'm not kidding. We had a two-week engagement. He said, cut it. We'll pay you for the two weeks. The bartenders, you made the bartenders ill. I said, they're... they're <laughs> It's too much for, for them. Oh, it's too much for all of us. Sorry. And they paid us for the two weeks, and we laid around and jammed and stuff. But, uh, that was a pretty wild fusion band. I mean, that was one of the first. And then, of course, Brecker Brothers came along, and then I think that was the, the big, great one you know, of, the, of all the fusion bands that I know. But then even Blood, Sweat, and Tears was heading that way and stuff with all the horn sections. Yeah. And, you know, that was years before that, 64, 65. Well, your ears held up over the years, as the, but some of that stuff was pretty darn loud. Oh, I remember doing two weeks up in Rochester with Steve Gadd's bass drum this far from my left ear when he was really hitting it. I mean, he wasn't taking it easy by any means. And he's got the greatest bass drum beat I've ever heard. Greatest on the planet. And if I didn't go deaf from that, nothing, nothing will. I had my ears tested a couple years ago. They said, well, you have the hearing of a 40-year-old man who's never been around anything loud. Blessed? I don't know. I played su such loud gigs with Mark Black, local singer-songwriter, a good friend of mine, we, we have a band that gets together on like solstices and equinoxes and weird times, and uh, that gets really loud at times. It used to get louder than it gets now. But, uh, so loud that you'll come home and you'll be awake till six or seven in the morning just from the screaming in your ears. But that's never done any damage to me. That's great. I've been in most fortunate. Glad to hear that. And working with uh, Steely Dan and Paul Simon. Different. How so? Two different worlds. Oh, the music. Steely Dan. I mean, changes. Great changes. Uh, that was the best gig I ever had, I think, of all the gigs. I think. If I had to name one that I loved more than any. Going out, that band hadn't gone out in 19 years, and I'd never been on one of their records. It's one of the things I'd always wanted to 
I'm like, oh, I'm going to the Steely Dan day. Oh, shit, I wish they'd call me. And then when they finally went out live, they called me. And I said, all right, this is fun. And first year was Peter Erskine on drums. Second year was Dennis Chambers. Uh, great drummers and great rhythm sections. Great horn sections. I mean, Chris Potter was both editions of that band. Uh, yeah, and then it, it, it's not one of those long-lasting gigs. I mean, they only go out for six weeks or something. You do a month of rehearsal, and then you do a six-week tour, and then you do that the next year. And you might go to Japan or something, you might go to Europe. And, but then uh, I remember I was up at my, my summer place in Wisconsin, and Art Garfunkel had called me to, can you do a European tour? And he'd sent me all this music, and it all happened very quickly, like FedEx, you know, and phone calls. And so within two days, I'd accepted this thing. The third day, Steely Dan calls to do a tour. And I said, this is another one of my rules, never cancel on anybody. Uh, so I said, geez, I'm sorry, I can't do it. And that was the end of my Steely Dan being an alumnus of Steely Dan. Uh, I go back occasionally and sit in, and, and I, I love Donald, and I don't get to see Walter that much, but Donald was a kid, I sometimes see him. Do those guys expect recreation of what's on the albums? Mm. Now, I remember George Wadinius came in and tried to play uh, Larry Carlton, Carlton's solo on Deacon Blues, and they didn't like that at all. They said, play your own solo. So I think they want to recreate certain aspects, like tempo, the vibe of, of the song, uh, something, the pulse, the... Uh, but uh, all of a sudden, he'll come in with a completely new arrangement of, uh, of a s standard Steely Dan tune. I'm trying to think of the name of one where he wrote an entirely new thing for it. Totally different. And we couldn't even play it, it was so different. I mean, uh, it's very exacting in a certain kind of way, especially tempo-wise. Like, I'd, I'd be, if anything that I'd start, I'd have Roger Nichols was the, unfortunately the late Roger Nichols was, was the monitor engineer of all things. And I had on these stage in-ear monitors, and he'd feed me a click track that was what Donald and all did. That's the tempo they want on this tune. Or you, or you give it to the drummer or whoever started the tune. Oh, I see it. If, so if and then they turn it off. As soon as you, you, you get two bars into it, then the click was gone. But once you establish that tempo, they were real sticklers on that. But it was a three and a half hour show. I had to change my clothes in intermission. I was just completely drenched. I lose 10 pounds in the show. There was a lot of effort and a lot of music, and there wasn't a bad song in it. Opening tune, Asia. I mean, that's like Simon and Garfunkel starting a set with Bridge Over Troubled Water. It just didn't, you don't do that, you know? But they, they had the guts to do anything they wanted to. And now they've been playing a different album every night, and people yelling out what album they want to hear, and they'll do Haitian Du Bois or something. You know, they'll do pretzel logic. I don't know how they do it. They're amazing. Now Paul's a whole different thing. He's a, he's a, he's also a stickler for tempos and uh, but we'll rehearse uh, every day. It wasn't a sound check. I mean Steely Dan quite all, I was the musical director so or rehearsal director or whatever you call it. If Donald Walter didn't want to show up in the afternoon when we were setting up I'd conduct it, you know. We'd go through some tunes and get the sounds right. And everything. But with Paul, it's like an art. Uh, you rehearse that day. You might change the whole show. It was constant, like, wait, now what did we learn today? Like, uh oh, that chord's out, and I got to do something different here in this section. That, oh, we, that's right, we decided to skip that. And, and then uh, there's a lot of tinkering with it while he's along. And it's very orchestral. Paul has an orchestral kind of ear, which is like, if you're an oboist, you don't play all the way through 
Beethoven's Sixth Symphony, you play when Beethoven says to to play, and it's the same thing being a pianist with him or something. You know. I think the probably the only reason I'm there is bridge over troubled water to begin with. It's a lot of guitars, and many guitars, and very little piano. Okay, you play air and then stop, you know, and then you play here and then stop, and that can change from night to night. So you always have to be on your toes. But the material is always great. I mean, it's like playing with the Beatles or something. I mean, the audience reaction. You know, and you see a grandfather and a father and a son all standing by the stage, all with tears running down. During the boxer or something near the end of the show, I mean, it's really moving. I mean, I used to cry at those shows. I hope they go out again. I'd love to do it tomorrow. Okay, I want to. <laughs> I want to try something. The blindfold right? test. Well, excuse my voice, okay? See if see if I can pull this off. See if we can name this tune. Da 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 da. Ba da 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 bum bum ba da da. Yeah. Okay. Do 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 Yeah. Well, it was originally you know the original title was folk song. Okay. And then Mike changed it to Sarah's Touch. And my uh, Manhattan Update album is the first time that tune ever appeared on record though mm -hmm. for Arista. I did the first version of it, and then Mike recorded it, and then I re-recorded it, and Steps did it this way and that way. It's been recorded a lot. Great song. Great song. It's got yeah. this something that just like, as soon as I heard it, it like really had this interesting combination of joy, but like also melancholy at the same time. And I wondered how that happens. Well, it happens a lot in music. I mean, I, certain, certain music I can almost barely listen to, like Celtic music or something. It's so melancholy, and, and even though it could be a happy song, there's something there that's just so powerful, ripping your heartstrings out. That I find it difficult to listen to, or maybe too powerful. That's what hit me with the first time I heard Bill Evans, is that he was playing, I don't know what tune he was playing, I think it was uh, Young and Foolish or something. And, and, and it was just beautiful jazz playing and improvisation, and yet there was something else there that was very deep and heartfelt and melancholy. Just this, like, uh, the, I don't know, I, used to read the Castaneda books about Don Juan. He said the universe is a very sad place. Mm -hmm. And I think it reminds you of that. Okay. As a great poems can do. You know, there's, there's several ways to get to it. Music, I find, to be the, the best way to get to it. Yeah. Let's suppose I uh, represented a patron of the arts commission to write a piano concerto. I'm not a composer. Well, or yet. Yet. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I, I write some tunes. Right. Well, how do you go but I never studied composition. Okay. I never studied counterpoint. I went to music school, but it was uh, <coughs> trying to get out of the Korean War and I lasted a week in music school. Really? I dropped out. Yeah. I, I didn't want to go over to Korea. And it was just ending, you know, at about that time. When, and, uh, I'm, not, I'm not a violent person. I don't think I've ever hurt anybody intentionally. Mm -hmm. well, I've only tried to bring joy okay. to people. So. How are we doing time wise? You have 14 minutes. Okay. Um, with with Lamage, am I pronouncing that right? Lamage, yeah. Lamage. With uh, 
you actually have three chordal instruments. Isn't that something? And, and, and no with, saxophone. With a stick, you could even have four, I yeah. suppose. What does that do for your musical choices? It's hard as hell to write for. And you don't want everybody comping at once. I mean, you know, we definitely have to, a lot of eye contact and just feeling each other out. I mean, it just takes a slight head movement of Mike Maneri to me to know who's comping on this next thing. There's a lot of, since there's no leader either, it's, it's difficult. But it's hard band to get lost in what you're doing because you have to be on your toes so much. Where's it going now? We're entering a new territory here. We've never been there before. Mm. And uh, how are we going to do it? Uh, sometimes I want guys to play more, actually, to, to really hear solos stretch out. And, you know, rather than sometimes David doesn't feel like playing more in a chorus or two. Where, I don't know. Some people don't have to. Look at Lester Leaps In. As he plays everything that you possibly do in eight bars in the bridge. I mean. Or Philly Joe told me, he said, uh, my favorite drummer of all time, by the way, he said, uh, I never heard Charlie Parker play more than four choruses. Ever. Even in the you jam know. session type yeah. thing. Yeah. He said he said it all in, in a very short amount of time. But there's certain times when, when something's really clicking and it's shifting gears, you know, that's got that great unnameable shift that happens where you want it to go in another gear. And Mike Maneri is great at that. He, he'll start off a solo and he'll go through five, six different gears in that solo. And you want him to stretch out, you know, and then maybe when he gets to third gear, the guitar should accompany him. And then and I might talk with, that, with David about it might say, you know, then let me take over. And then Mike would say, yeah, I want Warren to take over when I stop playing with four mouths and go to two and different things like that we'll talk about. So uh, some of it's thought out and, and uh, we try not to do too much of that. But with three chordal instruments, as you say, almost a fourth, you have to be very careful to pick your uh, moments. Is it hard to uh, book a group where everybody's got other things going on? It's impossible. Okay. Like the gig at the Arena, we hadn't played for a year. Just because of that. I mean, Steve's one of the busiest musicians on the planet. Tommy's one of the second busiest. Mike's in four different bands. He's got Steps Ahead, he's got Northern Lights, he's got solo and duet projects. and. We do a thing with Kazumi Watanabe, a trio in Japan. And, uh, and then David and I are kind of sitting around. I'm playing Rachmaninoff. I don't know what David's doing. It's not a busy time of uh, a lot of gigs for us. So it, it varies and, and it makes it extremely difficult to, to get a commitment is, is the hardest thing. Once you get a commitment, then we, we got a manager and a booking agent. We can book things. So. Okay. But it's not easy. Being green. <laughs> but getting green. Oh, you know, this day and age, the airline gets green. Uh -huh. yeah. they, we did a tour of Europe and they made most of the money. Yeah, that's what Lufthansa yeah. made most of the money. Yeah. Okay, so it's 2012. Um, this isn't really a musical question, but how are you feeling about the state of the country and How do I feel? I feel like every breath is a very precious gift. And the sky is never the same two moments in a row. And there's always something there that, uh, that's something you've never seen before that's brand new and uh, precious about being alive. It's that simple. Okay. You know, you got out of, not totally out of music, but you did the Pilates thing for a while. In 06, I decided to take a sabbatical, mm -hmm. more or less. 
and uh, went back to school to study Pilates, mm -hmm. to become a teacher. Because I loved doing it, and, and the gal that ran the studio, it's right down the road here. Uh, she said, well, we got a school going, and rather than taking three or four classes a week, why don't you sign up for this two-year teaching program and become a teacher, and you can do it nine times a week for less money. And, uh, really see if you like it. You know? And that turned out to be, I loved it, and there wasn't a lot happening musically at the time, and so I really did a about face and focused on that. And uh, it, was, it was a pleasure. I became, people tell me I was a really good teacher. I taught for about a year, and then the phone started ringing, and I started getting nervous. Music, and came back to music completely refreshed. And uh, I was a little sick of it. You know, after a while, you can do too much in one time. Uh, I think Pilates was great. Now I'm, my new thing is I'm, I'm, I want to get into yoga. I think that would be good at my age. And there's a lot of opportunity here. There's a lot of good yoga teachers. So, uh, and then play as much as I can. I, like I say, I'm working pretty much full time on this. Rock and Roll for Rhapsody. It takes that kind of concentration. And I've got it pretty well memorized now, but now the execution of it is like a very high level. So yeah, this can take a lot of work. Do you put recordings of it on and listen to it a lot? Or do you find that's not that helpful? Uh, if if I see a note that I think is wrong, I'll listen. I'll only listen to the Rachmaninoff version or him playing it. Because then the, the intent and the, the whole, what's the shape of this thing? What, what is, what's the point of it? it? Is there. And I'm still trying to find the point in that piece. What, what's the point that you reach in, in that 24 minute piece that makes What's the point of doing it? There's one moment in there for you, only for you, to find it. And if you either make the point or you miss the point. It sounds like high pressure. Of course, why should it be easy? God is pressure, isn't it? Uh, I heard somewhere. <laughs> Anything you'd like to? Yeah, I got one. Yeah, I do actually. Um, you mentioned something I didn't know. You had a heart attack about a year ago. How does that? I mean, you may have answered. I had a mild one. I was lucky. Okay, you may have answered that question about appreciating every moment with the changing of the light. But how did how did that how did that just affect your consciousness, your life? Well, it was scary. Uh, my father died of a heart attack in his fifties. I'm seventy three now. Uh, it made me go to, uh, I got a couple of good cardiologists. I had stent put in, which I needed. And they checked all the major vessels and, and put my mind at ease. They said, they're all fine. So don't eat anything with cholesterol in it. Don't eat any uh, certain kind of fats you don't want to eat. Put, watch your calories. Uh, and you're going to take these certain blood thinners and stuff. So I've done all that, and I went, I've gone to cardiac rehabilitation, which is basically treadmills and elliptical machines and arm machines and weights and with nurses' supervision. I, I go three times a week. Uh, and I don't recall feeling better than this at any point in my life. I mean, I'm in better shape than I've ever been in uh, as a result of that aerobic exercise. Pilates isn't aerobic, neither is playing the piano. <laughs> it's an extremely sedentary thing. So. Oh, here's uh, any students watching this. Don't practice more than 10 minutes. Wow. Get up and walk around. Hmm. Do something else. Come back, practice 10 minutes. And then uh, something I have to do when you're memorizing something, move the instrument because you start to memorize the room you're in. And you go out of the concert stage and you can't remember the goddamn thing. You know? I just 
thought of this as being helpful. If you just move it a centimeter, it changes everything. That's a really interesting piece of advice. The memory works in weird ways. Yeah. You want it to work in this, when you come into a strange, all on a strange yeah. instrument. Let's have one more question. We've got four minutes more. Okay. Um, so people, hopefully this, this archive is going to last a long time, and here you are for, for history, for generations to come. If there's anything you want to say to people that are way beyond, haven't even come to the planet yet, that may be watching well, this. Uh, uh, maybe they'll be aware by then that time works both ways, and I'd like to thank them for their contributions to what we're learning here now. It's coming not only from what we've experienced in the past. Time is kind of an illusion, uh, a dimension, maybe. Uh, I would say it, um, I like to phrase all at once to describe everything. Therefore, we're all here now, and we never will be anything but now for any of us. So, uh, great to see you all. You know, I, uh, I've inspected the future. I don't think Atlantis has happened yet. Well, on that note, lovely. Thank you very much. And it's been a real pleasure talking to you. And I have to well, say, I, I admire your career from, from the oh, Steely thank Dan you. and thank you. And all your own work. So. Yeah, my, my, uh, I'm, I'm proud of my recordings in, in a funny kind of way. It's almost like they're my children or something. You know? I don't do a lot of them, but they're genuine. They're really, really genuine. I've enjoyed this too. I, I didn't think I was going to enjoy it, and I turned out that I have. So thank you. Very much.